Well, good morning, Grace Community Church. It's good to be back. I've been on vacation a couple weeks. Good to be back with you. Um, this is the, the season of Advent, and it's the season where we look forward to uh, the long-awaited birth of Christ. Now, of course, that long-awaited birth of Christ has already happened a long, long time ago. But in the first century, there was a period of silence. Uh, there was a period of silence that had gone on for 400 years where the, the Israelites hadn't heard from God. So as they awaited for the Messiah to come, they waited having been in a, in, a, in a situation where there was just silence, where there wasn't a word from God for 400 years. And then that silence, that silence was broken in Bethlehem, in the middle of the night, in a manger, as a baby's cry cried out. The voice of God in the form of man and, uh, and in the form of an infant no less. Well, that baby, of course, grew uh, to be a man, fulfilled the law and all its righteous requirements, took upon himself the sin of the world, was crucified, was buried, and rose again. And we await that Savior's return. But the, the thing I want us to focus on just briefly before we go to prayer and then open up the Scriptures is the fact that the silence was broken. God intend, intended for His people, Israel, to hear from Him, and God became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. The silence was broken. This morning, we are going to look at the Scriptures in the book of Acts, and we are going to see that the silence is still broken. God still speaks. He spoke then in the book of Acts as the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church, he spoke to them then, and He speaks to us now, and we are going to take a look at just how that happens, how that works. So please go to the Lord with me in prayer, and we are going to ask that the Holy Spirit would speak to us through His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You that the silence was broken 2,000 and some odd years ago when Christ, Christ's child was born. We thank You, Lord, that He is the Word of God become flesh, that He dwelt among us, that He took on our sins, that He fulfilled the law and all its righteousness, and, uh, and Father, He is the Savior. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would guide us into truth, that you would speak to us through your word. Help us to understand the scriptures, to apply them, uh, Lord, because we want to hear from you that, we, that you might be glorified through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn your Bibles to the 13th chapter of Acts. We're going to start out exactly where you were last week. We're going to look at the same passage of scripture, but we're going to look at it with a totally different intent. How many of you were here last week? Okay, many of you were here uh, Pastor Paul preached on this very passage, Acts chapter 13, and the focus was on what the Holy Spirit said to them. So the Holy Spirit spoke to the church in Antioch as, uh, well, rather than me just get ahead of myself, let me just read it quickly so that you understand the context if you weren't here last week. Last week they looked at this passage and it says, now there were in the church of Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, um, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and set them off. If you were here last week, you'll remember that Pastor Paul, the focus of that message was on what the Holy Spirit said. The fact that the Holy Spirit established a pattern of ministry in the body of Christ which aimed at taking the gospel to the nations. It's important that all people know the gospel, but specifically what this shows us here is the Holy Spirit was, listen, it's great that you have a wonderful local fellowship in Antioch, but there are people all over the world who need Jesus, so you ought to go. And so the Holy Spirit said, send Paul and Barnabas. That's what the focus last week was on, was what the Holy Spirit said. This morning, we're not going to focus on what the Holy Spirit said, but the fact that the Holy Spirit said something. And the question of what, if the Holy Spirit spoke then, a couple questions, how did the Holy Spirit speak? How did the Holy Spirit speak in the first century when the New Testament church was established and, and the gospel was being spread? How did the Holy Spirit speak then? And, and does, in fact, the Holy Spirit still speak today? And if the Holy Spirit speaks today, how are we supposed to hear and how are we supposed to respond? I mean, is the, is the Holy Spirit of the first century church in Acts different than the Holy Spirit that is today? 
And, and if not, what's that even look like? Because honestly, I've never heard an audible voice in a prayer meeting other than the voices of the people praying. And I don't know that that was an audible voice. Luke doesn't say. He just says the Holy Spirit said. Doesn't say how the Holy Spirit spoke. Was this an audible voice? Was this an inward impression that all of the individuals received at the same time? We don't know. We're going to take a look at that. We're going to take a look at that this morning. Why, how does the Spirit still speak, and for what purpose does the Spirit speak? Now, for those of you who have been a part of this series and you've come week in and week out, what's the goal of the Holy Spirit? Quick quiz. What is the Holy Spirit's goal always about? Same answer every time. Make much of Jesus to bring glory to Christ. So why does the Holy Spirit speak? Remember before Jesus was crucified, before he was arrested, he prepped the disciples. He told them, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the wonderful counselor who's going to guide you. Let's take a look at one of the things that Jesus told them just prior to his being arrested. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will, check this out, not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare it to you, the things that are going to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. Here we see Jesus is telling them why the Holy Spirit's going to speak to them. The Holy Spirit is going to, future tense, going to speak to them when he comes so that Christ would be glorified. That is always what the Holy Spirit is about. So here's the deal. He spoke to them. We see this clearly in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, telling them to set apart Paul and Barnabas so that they could do the work that he had prepared for them, which was to take the gospel to the nations. What's he saying to us? Does the Holy Spirit still speak today? If so, how? Why? The why is answered right there. The why the Holy Spirit speaks to you and to me, and this is the goal of this morning to find out how, the why is because the God that created the universe, the stars, the planets, brought about life, all of these things created you, knit you together in your mother's womb. This God, this God is a personal God. This God, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This God, Jesus Christ, wants to have a personal, dynamic relationship with you as an adopted child of God. And to have that personal relationship, he wants to speak to you, hear from you, and wants to commune with you. This is an intimate relationship. This is not a set of rules or ethics imposed upon you, which you're to follow, which are divorced from a relationship. This is you and I walking with a personal God hearing from that God. Now, some of you, that freaks you out. I'm just going to state right now that you're like, oh my gosh, it's one of these churches. Where's the snakes? He's going to bring out the snakes. He's going to start getting weird on me. There are no snakes. I'm not going to get weird on you, but we are going to look at the scriptures to see what they say and seek to apply those very same scriptures. So the why is answered. The why the Holy Spirit spoke to them in the first century and why he still speaks to us today is right there, to glorify Christ. He's going to take from Christ and make it, declare it to us. And whatever we hear the Holy Spirit speak, it's what Jesus wants him to speak to us so that we can walk with Christ. Now, how does the Holy Spirit speak and or lead? I'm going to use, whenever you hear me the word, hear the word speak, um, I'm using it interchangeably with the word lead because sometimes it's not about audible. It's, in fact, most times it's not about audibly what you hear, but nonetheless, God speaks even though there's not necessarily an audible noise or voice that accompanies it. So when I, you hear me use the word speak or lead, I use them interchangeably from this point forward, okay? Make sense? So how does the Holy Spirit speak or lead? Direct revelation. Now, what's it say in parentheses there in the PowerPoint? Rare. Okay. Does the Holy Spirit, did the Holy Spirit speak directly and reveal things to the apostles? Absolutely. You've already had an example of that, two examples at least. A few weeks ago, Dr. Gilbaugh preached on Peter being called by the Holy Spirit through a vision. You remember he fell into a trance and the Holy Spirit 
said to him, go with the two dudes that are outside that are going to be arriving shortly. They're going to take you to a guy named Cornelius' house. That's pretty direct. I've never had a revelation like that. I've never had anything like that happen in all of my life. But I hear from God every single day. That's unique. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 2, the verse that you looked at last week with Pastor Paul, that these, uh, these leaders in the church in Antioch, Paul, Barnabas, uh, some prophets, some teachers, elders, pastors, they're all together, and, and they are doing what? What were they doing? They're doing two things. They're worshiping and they're fasting. Okay, they're worshiping and fasting. The word that's translated worship it means to render service unto God in the context in which they've been gifted. So they're doing their pastoral elderly duties, whatever those are, as being a teacher, being pastors, being a prophet, being an apostle. So they're ministering in service to the Lord and they're fasting. They're depriving themselves of food and or water or something external that they usually depend upon in order that they can... This is not a hunger fast to try to manipulate God to do something that God does not want to do. But you fast in order to, 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 um, to kind of clear your mind, clear your mind in, in such a way that you can hear from God because you desire to do His will. Okay, that's, that's what's going on here. And they heard the Holy Spirit say, set apart Paul and Barnabas. Now, why do I say that's rare? The book of Acts, it covers about 30 plus years in, in church history from the time that Jesus ascended. Um, to the establishment of, uh, of global missions and Paul's missionary journeys. So 30 years, there's about a dozen times that Luke records something like this. That's not very many in 30 years. And these are apostles, okay? These are apostles. So I say that that's rare. Sometimes it was in visions, like I mentioned in, in Peter's vision, to, when the Holy Spirit said to go visit Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. Sometimes... Um, it doesn't say how. Acts chapter 8, verse 29, the Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over to that chariot and stand by it. Okay? And what does Philip encounter? There's an Ethiopian sitting in a chariot with his entourage, and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. So Philip says, what you reading? He says, Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? No. How am I supposed to understand until someone explains it to me? Oh, I guess now I know why the Holy Spirit told me to come over here. So he hops up in the chariot, tells him that this is Jesus, and, the, and uh, explains the gospel. And the Ethiopian says, well, I, I want to trust in him. I want to be baptized. So he's baptized right then and there. At the end of this service, you're going to see three baptisms of, of individuals who have trusted Christ as well. And then in Acts chapter 13, as we already mentioned, the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Paul and Barnabas. But notice in neither, one of those, in neither one of those cases, Luke never says, and Philip heard an audible voice. And the elders and leaders in the church of Antioch heard an audible voice. It doesn't say how. It doesn't say the means by which the Holy Spirit spoke to them. It just said that he did. So we're not really sure exactly what that looks like, what it means. And sometimes uh, God spoke through prophets. You can turn to Acts chapter 21, verse 11. And, and it says that the Holy Spirit, Luke records, the Holy Spirit said through the prophet Agabus to Paul, Paul, the owner of this belt, and it happened to be Paul's belt, he wrapped it around his hands, the owner of this belt will be bound and led away and arrested when he goes to Jerusalem. And lo and behold, what happened to Paul when he went to Jerusalem? He was arrested and led away. And, uh, and then he was taken before kings and Rome and so forth and so on. So the Holy Spirit would speak in vision. Sometimes the Holy Spirit would speak, but doesn't say how he spoke. And sometimes the Holy Spirit would speak through prophets. Now, I don't know. Uh, I've never experienced a vision, but I have heard the Holy Spirit speak. Okay? I, I've never heard the Holy Spirit audible, but I know, in fact, that it, it is God that, is, that has and, and is, is speaking. Okay? So let's, let's keep going. Well, how? If, if, if those are rare... What's the more common way? Now, what I'm going to put up here next isn't rare at all. It's very, very commonplace, but it's no less supernatural than any one of those three. Okay? I'm going to repeat that for emphasis. What I'm about to put on next on the PowerPoint slide is very, very common, and this is the common means by which the Holy Spirit spoke to the church in the first century, 
and how he speaks to us today, but it is no less supernatural than visions or audible voices or through the prophetic utterance. It's very, very important that you not lose sight of that for reasons that I'll explain in a moment. How does the Spirit speak and lead? Through the application of His Word. And some of you are like, oh, boring. Well, that's the problem with the church today. You want sensationalism. You don't want anything that's practical. And I say that as a rebuke, if that's you. So take it for what it's worth. Now, let's take a look at this. Turn to Acts chapter 15. This is a passage we're going to look at in some depth next week. But, uh, and so I'm not going to really talk too much about what they're, uh, what they're debating here. This is the first great controversy in the New Testament church after Jesus ascended. Uh, Greg alluded to this a few weeks ago in the, in the conversion of Cornelius the Gentile. Um, Gentiles and Jews, oil and water, they don't mix. And it was clear that Gentiles were coming to Christ in droves and there were many in Jerusalem that had a problem, not with Gentiles coming to Christ, but with the fact that they weren't becoming Jews in the process. They weren't being circumcised. Paul, or, uh, Greg already talked about that a few weeks ago. So there was a great debate, and this sharp dissension arose in the church. And so they called together this council, and the council included Peter and James and John, all the apostles. Paul and Barnabas came uh, from Antioch, and so they all got together together. And they prayed, and they searched the Scripture, and they talked about this. They heard from Peter, tell us about your experience with Cornelius. They heard from Paul and Barnabas, tell about the church in Antioch and, and how these people received the Spirit. And, and then there were those who said, no, these people got to be circumcised. If you're not Jewish, you ain't nothing. You, Christ is important, but you got to be Jewish too. And there was, there was a sharp battle going on, okay? That's for next week. But you have to understand the context. Now, here's what they concluded. In verse 22... Then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas called uh, Bersabbas and Silas, leading men among the brothers with the following letter. Okay, so here's the contents of the letter. Brothers, both the apostles and the elders, uh, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, greetings. Since we've heard that some persons have gone out from us and they've troubled you with words unsettling your minds, though we gave them no instructions, catch this. Don't miss this. It seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them with you to our beloved uh, Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, from blood, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. Do you know what he just said? He just said that the Holy Spirit led us as a collective group of Christians to come to unity of one accord as we studied the Scriptures on how the gospel applies to the Gentile. It says nothing about an audible voice. He said, it seemed good to us, and then he explained it, and then he threw in, oh, and by the way, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And you're like, wait a minute, I read Acts chapter 15, and I never see the Holy Spirit showing up and saying, tell them the following. It's in the Word of God. It's in the Word of God. They're, they're applying the Word of God accurately and they're doing so in one accord, in prayer and unity, and they're struggling to... They're seeking the will of the Lord, and they find the will of the Lord because the will of the Lord is in the Word. The will of the Lord is in the Word. There's two parts to this. First of all, you, you, you can't apply the Word of God and hear from the Holy Spirit unless you understand the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness, so the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 12 and 13 says that the Word of God is living and active. It's a double-edged sword, piercing joint and heart and marrow. Okay, the, the Word of God is not just printed text. It's living. It's God-breathed. It comes out from the God, the Holy Spirit, as the apostles and, or whoever, the prophets in the Old Testament, 
as they, as they wrote, as the Holy Spirit led them along, the words that they write are no less alive today than when they were penned. And they're useful, they're living, they're active. In Psalm 19, Psalm 19 says that, David says, I have hidden your word in my heart, God, that I might not sin against you. How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word, O God. There's power there. This is, this is the voice of God. It's not audible. It's not a dream. It's not a vision. It's, it's right here. If you have a Bible, you have the word, literally, of God. Literally. It's, 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 it's the same word then that it was is today. Let's keep going. But then there's the application of God's word. It's one thing to have a Bible. It's one thing to have the Word of God. It's even one thing to understand what it means. It's quite another to apply it. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8, the Apostle Paul, in describing gifts that are given to individuals within the church to build up the church, he says, some have been given uh, a gift of knowledge and a gift of wisdom to understand the Word and help people apply the Word. To, wisdom is not just the accumulation of facts and knowledge and trivia, and, and theological tidbits about what the Bible says. Wisdom is, okay, I know the gospel, and here's how it applies to my life. Here's how I apply it in this situation. And, and in the church, there are individuals who help people understand and also help people apply. And, and so there's a, an understanding and an application of God's word. All right, now here's, here's where we have to get in the nitty gritty. You remember a couple, uh, I've said this repeatedly as we're studying Acts, and it, it bears repeating over and over and over again. The following, Acts, the book of Acts, is descriptive. It's history, right? But it's not prescriptive. It's not telling us, here's how you do things. Luke's just saying, they got together for a prayer meeting, they were praying and they fasting, and the Holy Spirit told them to set apart Paul and Barnabas. That's not a formula. Paul, Luke's not saying you have to establish, choose a night, one night of the week, and pray and fast, and then get together, and then the Holy Spirit's going to tell you two individuals that he's going to send on world missions. You might do that, and the Holy Spirit might do that, but that's not, that's not what Acts is about. Acts is descriptive. It's not prescriptive. The epistles, the letters that Paul wrote, Galatians, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, etc., cetera, uh, that James wrote, uh, that bears the letter by his name, the book of Hebrews, the three letters that John wrote, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, uh, the, the epistle written to the Hebrews, those are descriptive. They do tell us the hows. Those questions that Acts doesn't tell us, well, how do you do this? They do tell you in, in other parts of the Word of God. So let's take a look at what Paul means when he says, here's how you hear and are led by the Spirit of God. As a New Testament Christian, whether it's 1st century or 21st century, here's how this works. Galatians chapter 5. Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So Paul is clearly saying you have a choice here. There, you can follow the, the voice of your flesh. You say, what do you mean by the flesh? Your stomach, your libido, whatever it is you feel you want to do. Here's something that I, I uh, it's, it's a pet peeve of mine. I hear this a lot in, uh, as, as, as I read about people getting divorced and, and doing all sorts of absolutely stupid things. And here's what usually is proceeding whatever the blank, fill in the blank. I just want to be happy, so I just want to follow my heart. Translated, I just want to follow my flesh. Now, Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all who can understand it. Be very, very careful when you say, I'm just following my heart. Because what that translates to is, I just have a sexual appetite that I need to fulfill it. I just have a desire for more money that I need to fulfill. I just need to have a desire to remove myself from the absence of conflict, and my spouse is the one bringing the conflict. So you can, you can justify anything utterly that's absurd that the Holy Spirit and the Scriptures say don't do. If you follow your heart, it'll get you into trouble. Unless your heart is submitted to the voice of reason that comes from the Holy Spirit. 
That's why Paul says these are opposed to each other. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So that's the question. Okay, what do you mean led by the Spirit? Well, here's what it not means. You can choose not to listen to the Spirit. Instead, you can choose the flesh. Very next verse. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. You know you're not listening to the Holy Spirit when the following happens. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, strife, enmity, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, Paul's saying, if that characterizes your life from start to finish, and your life is utter chaos, and you're you're filled with jealousy, fits of rage, and sexual, whatever, all of these different things, you have good reason to question, do I ever hear from God? Am I following God at all? Maybe I should rethink whether or not I actually belong to Him. Because that actually describes my life. And Paul says, that's not a good thing. So that's what happens when you, when you tune out the Holy Spirit and you just listen to your fleshly desires. Or just follow your heart like any pop song sings. Follow your heart because your heart, be true to thine own heart. And you too will have a divorce or fall into adultery. Don't be true to thine own heart unless thine own heart is true to the Holy Spirit's leading. That's safe. Okay, we're going to get to how that works. So then here's the contrast. We have to choose to listen. But the fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Then he says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The the voice of the flesh is very strong. It's not going to shut up. It's always going to scream, feed me, feed me, feed me, do what I want, do what I want, do what I want. And what Paul is saying here is that if you're listening to the Holy Spirit, he's going to ask you to crucify that voice. Tell yourself to shut up. And listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, which is going to guide you and direct you in a way that's going to bring about the fruit of the Spirit, which is listed there. But here's the thing. We don't often trust the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're like, no, I don't trust you. If I submit to you, I know that I can't have joy because my current circumstance is not joyful. I'm not happy in this place. And yes, I know, Holy Spirit, you're saying that I'm supposed to reconcile to this person, but this person I don't like. And they're mean to me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what most people don't realize is that Paul is writing these very words as he's chained to a Roman guard in prison. So he's like, you know, just play me a sad song on the smallest violin in the world because your circumstances are bad. I'm writing this chained up, and I'm full of all of these things because I've submitted myself to the Spirit. So he understands our pain. He just isn't whining because he's filled with joy because he's used to listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit and submitting his own desires to the desires of God. Okay, now, how do we do this, though? That's the question. How does this even work? How does this work? How does the Holy Spirit lead? He leads by his word, but how? First of all, moral imperatives. These are commands to obey, commands to obey. I'll give you just two examples. For example... Jesus says to the disciples, as he's just prior to his ascension, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching that obey everything that I have commanded. So the question, are you a disciple? That's a yes, no question. Are you a follower of Christ? Yes, then you're a disciple. Uh, Maybe not a very mature one. Maybe you haven't been doing this for very long. But if you're a disciple of Christ, what's the command? That you, being a disciple, you go make other disciples. And you're like, well, I don't want to do that. Well, then you're a rebellious disciple because that's what the Holy Spirit's saying. You say, well, how do you know the Holy Spirit said that? Because it's in Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19. It's Jesus' commands to all his disciples. You you follow the logic here? Jesus said it. It's in the Word. It's an imperative. It's a command to all Christians. We're to just do this. Now, it will look different in terms of how each Christian does that, But the command is still a command. It's an imperative. Here's another one. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So, husbands, is it optional for you to love your wife? Yes or no? No, it's not optional. That is a command. Now, what that looks like and how you carry out that command 
it, it, there's lots and lots of different ways that that might be carried out. So the command is a moral imperative. These are The Holy Spirit gives us these dictates, love your neighbor as yourself, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, we could... That's what the New Testament and the Old Testament, I mean, the Old New Testament is just filled with imperatives. Things not to do and things to do. These are imperatives. They're not optional. The Holy Spirit just said, do these or don't do these. And, and, but the, here's, the, here's the question, well, what does this look like? And then there's the, the, optional, the, op, or, uh, the second part here, life application. These are principles to apply. Um, in terms of, uh, you have the imperative go and make disciples of all nations, okay? But what's a life application? Well, for me, I never heard, I never heard an audible voice. I never had a dream, never had a vision. But I, I recognize the Lord has, and I use the word led in quotations because there is nothing audible about it. It's just I recognize that a way that I am to make disciples is to, is to teach and to preach. That's not the only way I make disciples. Or I, I might have led my children in a devotional when they were growing up, okay? That's an application. That's an application. Um, or you might be led to, uh, I feel compelled to invite my neighbor to lunch and, and share my testimony, how I came to Christ. That's the beginning of making a disciple. Or you might sit down with a cup of coffee over somebody who's struggling in their marriage and, and you tell them how you struggled in your marriage and how, how following Christ has changed things and turned things away. That's an application of making disciples. Or husbands, you're commanded to love your wife as Christ loved the church and you know that your wife craves and desires meaningful conversation. And so you shut the TV off and you ask her, what have you been reading in the Word recently? That's an application of loving your wives as Christ loved the church. You didn't necessarily hear an audible voice, but you know that that's one thing that would make the moral imperative, the command to obey something tangible. I think I'll do that. The Holy Spirit leads in those ways. I follow the Spirit's lead whenever I act in such a way that a moral imperative is obeyed. Now, there's different ways that that happens. Sometimes the leading can be audible and direct, although that's rare, it can happen, i.e., Acts chapter 8, verse 29, Philip standing on the road to Samaria, and the Spirit says, go over by that, that chariot. You can't get any more direct than that. An audible or, or clearly command from the Lord, which is not found in Scripture, but it, it lines up with what you would find in Scripture. And then there's, sometimes it's not audible, but it's still direct. It's still as clear as the bell. Uh, I've shared this story many, many times. I'm not going to go into the gory details, but many years ago before I became a Christian, I was uh, a pagan, and I'm not going to glorify my sin, but sexually immoral and all that stuff. And then I met my wife, and we started dating. And I was very, very convicted that I needed to confess my my sin before I became a Christian to her because it involved me sinning against her, but I said, absolutely not, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't for 10 years. And then in 1997, I didn't hear any audible voices, okay? But I was reading the scriptures and studying them intently, and, and the scriptures that I had already planted in my head were screaming at me, but nothing audible. If you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship with God and one another. If you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive. He'll you know, purify and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And I just, I would hear these, the, the scriptures would just scream in my head that, Brooks, you're not walking in the light with your wife. She knows nothing about your past. You've never shared that with her. I said, yeah, but it's all in the blood. I wasn't even a Christian. Blah, 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 blah. Wine, 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 wine. And it was almost as if God said, listen. You can continue to walk in the shadows or you can step into the light and be the man of God I have called you to be. So do it. I never heard a voice. But as, soon, as real as I'm standing here today, it was the Lord telling me to walk in the light. How do I know that it was God? Because it lined up with what His Word said. It was completely consistent. That if I was going to love my wife as Christ loved the church... I had to become one flesh with her and that meant that I couldn't have stuff in my closet that I was hiding from her because that was preventing intimacy. I never heard a voice. I never had a vision. But I, I can tell you that was the word of God. 
because it was consistent with his word. It was a life application of a moral imperative. And sometimes it's not anything so dramatic. Sometimes it's like, you know what? I just think it's a good idea to take my wife out on a date tonight and ask her about her day. I think that would fulfill the command of Ephesians 5.25. So is that the Holy Spirit? Well, if it brings glory to God, roll with it. Now, that could get me into heresy, couldn't it? Because you can justify a whole bunch of stupid things by saying, you know what? I got a piece of plastic here. Get the old MasterCard out. We're going to take a vacation to Vegas. That would make my, well, not Vegas, Hawaii. <laughs> that would make my wife happy. So therefore, I'm going to obey a moral imp imperative with a life application of putting a $2,000 vacation on a credit card and God will be glorified. Not so much because I just sprinted through a whole bunch of warnings that the Holy Spirit also says in Scripture. Okay? So I'm trying to be careful here. Preaching this sermon is kind of like walking through a minefield. I'm trying not to get my limbs blown apart as I'm navigating through this very, very difficult subject. So if a knee flies over there, just call a medic and we'll try to get through the rest of the sermon. So that's how this works. That's how this works. In a practical sense, here's the posture, though, that you have to have, that I have to have, that we have to have as a Christian in order to hear from God. Okay? Here it is. James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Prerequisites for hearing God. Here's the prerequisites that are taken from that passage in James chapter 1. Uh, these are adapted from a, a very, very old book called The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit by R.A. Torrey, a, uh, a contemporary of D.L. Moody's, about 150 odd some odd years ago. In chapter 18, there's a specifically a chapter which says, okay, how do you know the Holy Spirit's calling you to some vocation? So the context here is the big questions like, how do I know God's calling me to be a missionary? How do I go, know God's calling me to... And, a, and the question that Tori tries to answer is, can God call specifically to something like that? And the answer to the question is, yes, he does sometimes, but not always. I never heard a clear, audible call from God that I should preach at Grace Community Church. Just didn't. But could someone? Sure he could. Anyway, Tori goes through how to know that that's the case. I'm not going to go through that whole chapter. If you're really struggling with a really big life decision, how do I know this is God's will? I encourage you to get this. It's free on the internet. It's a, it's, you can download it as a free ebook, or you can get it off Kindle. And it's uh, chapter 18 is the specific uh, chapter that he speaks to that. But here's five principles that do apply regardless of the, the scope of the decision or whatever it is God might be or might not be leading you to. These are the prerequisites that you, have, you and I have to have if we're going to hear from God. And the first is humility. And that's what James is saying. If any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask. If you think you know it all, you won't ask. It's like, I got it, I'm good. I know exactly what I'm supposed to do today, so therefore you never ask. The person who's humble admits their need of guidance. Lord, I want to honor you today, and I'm not exactly sure what you want me to do today. What do you want me to do? Show me how you want me to apply what you've given in today's context. How do you want me to love my wife? How do you want me to love my kids? How do you want me to love my neighbors? How do you want me to make disciples? What, Lord? What? Okay? That's, that's the uh, humility. Second is motive. It's, he says, but when you ask, don't ask and doubt. In other words, ask with a clear motive. The motive from hearing from God is not to say, you know what, I hear from God. But to actually hear from God and obey it. Ten years ago, at least, I preached a series on the Ten Commandments. And, uh, and this particular series, I preached on the Third Commandment which is after the second and before the fourth. Now, it's the command, do not take the Lord's name in vain, right? And I, I shared with the whole church one of my pet peeves. And I'm sure I'm going to offend someone. So I should just write an apology in advance all the time whenever I preach. It would just require, it would cover so many bases. 
And what I said then, and I've softened my approach a little bit, but I said it, I was way over the top. Imagine that I would be over the top. But I, I said it in a very forceful way. It drives me nuts when people say, God told me. Now, see, I offended probably about half of you, all right? Now, obviously, we're studying in the Word that God does clearly tell us, right? So I'm not against people saying that. But the flippancy and this frequency at which people say that, God told me I should go to Starbucks today. God told me I should wear my gray socks instead of my blue socks. God told me I should have blueberry pancakes and not chocolate chip pancakes. Okay, I'm being somewhat flippant here, but you hear that so often, and what many people, not all, but what many people mean when they say that is, I felt like this was a legitimate application of what God would want me to do then why not just say that? But instead, when you say God told me, you make your feeling of a right application of God's word on equality and the same footing as the holy inspired word of God. And what if it's not? You ever thought about that? Now, naturally, someone got really ticked because I wasn't as articulate as I was just now. And I hadn't spent 20 minutes saying that God does speak to us. I just said, it drives me nuts when I hear that. So this guy was mad and he sent me an email. So I met with him. I heard him out and I backed off and I said, listen, I believe God speaks to us. And yeah, he could speak to us in a dream and a vision. He could. And in some parts of the world, that's actually not uncommon. In the Muslim world, where the name of Jesus is not preached and there, and there aren't a lot of Christians, it is not an uncommon thing at all for someone who is a Muslim to have a dream or a vision specifically in a very clear manner that, for example, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a Muslim name. I'm just going to make up a non-Muslim non name. Fred the Muslim, all right, in Damascus. Fred the Muslim has a dream and a vision that he meets Jim, who's wearing a red jacket in the market, who's going to tell him about Jesus and give him the Injil, the Bible. And so what do you suppose happens the next day? But he meets Jim in a red coat, and he says, I had a vision last night. I'm supposed to ask you if I have a Bible. And Jim's like, well, that's really weird, because I happen to have a Bible, and my name's Jim. This is strange and freaky. Here's the Bible. He comes to Christ. Those things happen really scarily frequently in the Middle East. So, have I made my point that I'm not a hardcore cessationist and I do believe God speaks today? Yes. However, when I met with this individual, as I shared what I believed, he was still adamant about the importance of seeking God's will through dreams and visions. And I just was confused by the necessity of and the insistence upon this. And he, was, he asked me to read this book, and so I looked at it, and it was a book that promoted, well, you need to seek God and visions and dreams and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you that way. It was curious to me that this was even necessary. And then it all started to make sense as I talked to this guy's faith family leader. This guy hadn't been in the Word for about three months, but he's praying for God to speak to him through dreams and visions. And lo and behold, his marriage was an utter train wreck because what he did know of God's word, he wasn't applying. Don't be that guy. God was screaming to this individual through the very, very clear word of his mouth, the scriptures, and he was like, la, 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 I have to hear a dream, I have to have a vision or it's not valid. That's, that's utter arrogance. Do not ask to hear from God unless you have a motive to desire and know and do His will. That's the point. Very long second point, but it's very important in this context. Third, active listening. Men, the difference between actively listening to your wife and passively listening is that when you passively listening, you're hearing what she's saying, and the only thing you're trying to do is like, okay, in the event she asks me, what am I saying? I should be able to repeat it back. But there's no real intent on engaging her because Michigan State is beating Ohio State, and this is clearly important. Yes, it is. 
Okay, so, so you're, you're, in, you're not really listening, but you, on the event that she says, what did I just say to you? You said that we have to go to a mother-in-law's and we're going to meet at 4 o'clock for dinner and so forth and Christmas and to make sure you wear your ugly sweater. Say, so I was listening. No, you weren't. You were heard. That's not the same thing as listening. Active listening is, I want to know your heart. Turn the TV off. Turn towards your wife. And this, this is a metaphor. Turn towards the scripture and say, Lord, what is your will for my life? What does it mean for me to love my wife as Christ loved the church? What does it mean for me to make disciples? What does that even mean? What's the application? You're reading the word. You're in prayer. God, tell me, show me. And you surround yourselves with other Christians that they can instruct you as well. Curious thing. When the Holy Spirit said to the people in Antioch, what were they doing? They collectively, plurally, were all fasting and praying. It was a corporate thing, not a private revelation. Are you in fellowship with other Christians? I don't like people. (laughs) You're a people. You ever think that someone might not like you? The Holy Spirit says, bear one another's burdens. Live life with one another. Love one another. You can't do that in isolation. Get in the word. Pray. Seek his will. Actively listen. Believe. When you ask, know that God wants you to know. That's what he gave you his word for. And then lastly, obey. Be intent to act on whatever you hear. Act on what you hear. So many people want God's word to be like a Garmin. You plug in the address, heaven, now I need turn-by-turn instructions, or I can't leave the driveway. Here's what you mean. I need to know what I'm going to do next month, the month after that, 10 years from now. I need to have it all mapped out, or I can't get out of the driveway. You know what the Holy Spirit wants you to do? Take the next step. These are... Step-by-step instructions. He's not going to give you what he needs you to do a week from now until you do what he wants you to do right now. Now, here's the question. Before we go to baptisms, what is God speaking to you about? Just like for me back in 1997, I know right now, I know because God told me. Just kidding. naughty. I know because of the sheer number of people and statistical averages that there's someone in this room who is wrestling with the Holy Spirit just like I was. Guarantee it. I'd bet my life on it. I know it. There's probably hundreds of you right now that are wrestling over something specifically you know God wants you to do, but you're afraid to do it. Step, and he will put firm foundation under your feet. And then ask him what the next step is. You see, delayed obedience, you know another word for that? Is disobedience. And to hear the word of the Lord day in and day out, day in and day out, day in and day out, and say later, 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 is basically you're grieving the Holy Spirit. We had that message a while ago. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Submit to the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Spirit because He still speaks. What does He want you to do? Love, forgive, reconcile, repent, forsake some sin, serve, give of yourself, give of your money, share your faith, surrender. I don't know. I don't know your circumstances. But the Holy Spirit knows you intimately better than you know yourself. And He has a word for you. And as we pray for baptisms, Just as importantly, many of you need to begin that relationship with Christ. Jesus says, unless you're born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Are you born again? You say, I don't even know what that means. You're going to hear three testimonies of individuals who decided to trust and to follow Christ, to receive forgiveness. They were not born into Christian homes. Nobody's born a Christian. If you're a Christian, you've been born again. And they chose to believe that Christ died for their sins. They cried out to him, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins. For some of you, that's your first step. And then ask the Lord for the next and the next and the next. But whatever it is the Holy Spirit's leading you to do, take that step. I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and we're going to hear some uh, some testimonies. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the fact that you do speak to us. Thank you that your word is as true now as it was when you inspired it. 
And Lord, we thank you for the testimonies and the baptisms we're about to see. And Father, we just bring you glory. And Lord, we just pray that if you're speaking right now to someone, that you'd make that very clear, what their, uh, what their application is and uh, what it means for them to take that next step.